Good morning. Good morning. So, um, welcome to this session on planet. So, we, we have got a very broad topic, but we're going to focus down, and we're going to focus on to those areas where our distinguished panel um, are particularly expert in. Um, we're going to hear from two representatives from the private sector committed to the sustainable development goals, and also from a think tank on water issues. So, my name is uh, Johan Schielenscherner. Um, and I'm the policy director of the Stockholm Environment Institute. And SEI is a, an international research institute um, bridging science and policy um, in the field of environment and development. And we carry out research dealing with many of the issues covered by the SDGs, um, including water use and quality, climate change, climate finance, sustainable sanitation, air pollution, sustainable consumption production, resource management, and issues like that. Um, and we're based in six centers, about 200 people now across the world. So we've also been helping to, um, with the development of the SDG framework, um, as one of the institutes in an independent research forum, which has been <coughs> facilitating learning by decision makers and policy makers um, about the issues covered by the SDGs. So, so I'm particularly pleased to be asked to chair this session on SDGs relevant to the health of the planet. As a background to our discussions, we have some highly relevant um, SDGs that our panelists have particular expertise to address. So one of those is SDG 6 on clean water and sanitation, where um, the intention is to ensure sustainability and sustainable management, um, availability, ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all people. We have SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production, ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. And SDG 15, life on land, um, protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, um, sustainably manage forests, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. So um, I could also mention the SDG 13 on climate change and the SDG 3 on good health and well-being. So one thing is clear is that some of the issues that we're dealing with cover all of these SDGs. Um, we've heard quite a bit here about the Hayes problem, um, and that will cover most of those SDGs and even more. Um, and of course, you can't really separate environment from the social systems and the economic systems that we all rely on. So now I will um, briefly introduce our panelists. So um, we have Inge Valache who is the uh, Communications and Engagement Director of the International Water Association. And the IWA helps water professionals deliver solutions for water and sanitation. And um, she started in the private sector, but now uses her skills to use um, communication to bridge the gap between science and practice in the water sector. Um, she brings her experience um, of also being, having been before the Communications Director at Greenpeace International, I think is correct. Um, we have then, next to her, we have Friedrich Hendriksson, who is the Head of Sustainability and Communications at Indiska. It's a Swedish company selling clothes, accessories, and home products. And under his leadership, Indiska was awarded the most sustainable retail store chain in the Swedish Retail Awards in 2015. So, um, and you've been there five years, I think, or something. So that was obviously down to you then. <laughs> so... Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Agus Pernomo, Agus Pernomo um, who is the Managing Director of Sustainability and Strategic Stakeholder Engagement at Golden Agri Resources. So Golden Agri is the world's second largest palm oil plantation company with about 500,000 hectares in Indonesia. Um, and he is responsible for company sustainability strategy and has previously advised several ministers in Indonesia and was also the Executive Director of WWF from 96 to 2002 in Indonesia. So we have a very um, distinguished panel. And um, as a sort of, uh, just a, a focus for our discussions next, we've been told in the plenary presentations that the private sector has the power to achieve, help achieve these SDGs and make significant change. If so, there are some key framing questions. So how are companies going to translate the SDGs and those targets, global targets, into clear quantitative targets of their own companies, for their own companies, and how will they measure progress, um, investing in better reporting and so forth? And also, how will the companies take responsibility for the supply chain, um, much of which is 
in uncontrolled informal sectors. But first, I'd like to um, just give an opportunity for the panelists to um, give a, um, their thoughts on the SDGs and, and its implications for their activities. And at first, I'd like to turn to you, um, Agus, um, if you'd like to tell us for about three minutes on uh, the activities that you're doing and how they're going to be uh, impacted by the SDGs. Thank you, Johan. Well, I, I think great minds are alike, though the private sector is not part of the SDG negotiation. Uh, but we do share some of the goals, and I, I would like to go a bit on some of the points of the SDG. You mentioned about the water, the land, and there is also this issue of food security that we are contributing to provide uh, the, the need for the uh, increased population of the world. On water and land, most of the big companies on palm oil, including mine, uh, that, that I'm working for, uh, we have a commitment to not develop an area that still have forests. Forests in terms of high carbon stock forests and also forests that has high biodiversity value, high conservation value. And many of us, uh, the big palm oil companies, have that policies for a number of years. We also, at least my company, also have no uh, peatland development. So that contributes also to the other SDG goal of reducing greenhouse gases. As we are all aware of, uh, many of the emissions on agriculture are coming from the type of soils that they are planting. And planting on peatland uh, have a, a big risk of emitting greenhouse gases. Since 2010, the Golden Agri Resources have a commitment to not develop new plantation on peatland. We also, for almost 15 years, more than 15 years, have a policy to not use fire in opening up new plantations. And <clears throat> therefore, it's a bit irony when uh, the perceptions uh, promoted in many medias that the haze and fires season in the last several months is caused by uh, palm oil plantations. It may come from some of the plantations, but it definitely not come from the big companies who have been practicing no burning for the last uh, 15 to 10 years. In, in the case of fire, the Golden Agri Resources burned area is only 0.5%. And most and all of the source of fire came in from outside the plantation. And we are able to put it off in a few hours. So yes, we got burned, but it's very, very small, 0.5%. And we put it off in a few hours. So that's what we are doing on the SDG-related environmental issues. On the social and community engagement, we are also adopting the free prior and informed consent principle. And that is actually a bigger challenge for us than the environmental issues. As you are aware of, on palm oil, there are millions of smallholders. Uh, the big five companies probably only planted in about 10% of the total plantation area. More than half are planted and controlled uh, by smallholders, farmers with the ownerships of one to three hectares per family. And, and therefore, it becomes crucial when trying to help saving the environment, we solve the problem of social issues. I think I need to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Inge, could you, could you explain how the SDGs affect the work that you're doing with all your stakeholders? Sure. Let me make sure. Yes, this works. <laughs> um, as an association that brings together water professionals, we're very excited about the SDGs. Um, and it moves because we bring people together across the sectors and across disciplines. So whether you're from a corporation or whether you're working in academia or government, you can be part of the IWA. The SDGs go further than the MDGs. The SDGs actually are no longer just about clean water. It also addresses wastewater and resource management. So it really goes across the water cycle. The targets are ambitious, but I think it's good. Um, they're clear. Indicators are being established. 
Um, those will only be agreed early next year, and politically or methodologically, it could be challenged by some of the nations whether the indicators will in fact uh, be good enough uh, to measure the targets. But we believe as an association that that should not stop us because we know what the right thing is to do. We know that we can put the solutions in place. And not just for the water uh, sector's sake, so the water goal is one, but the beauty about water is it touches far more. So it touches a lot of the other SDGs as well because if we can get the right, human right to water and sanitation in place, we know that it affects poverty, we know it affects female participation in society, we know it affects education. So we just need to up the ante with regards to putting those solutions in place. And it's across the stakeholders where that really matters. So I think for us, it's very important to look at it holistically. And one key area is investment. There will be a lot of investment needed to get uh, water to where it's all needed. And not just for humans, but also for ecosystems. And those investments, I think we need to be aware that addressing the water goal is one thing, but it needs energy and it addresses climate challenges. So we can't achieve a water goal and forget about the other goals. So I think it's very crucial for us all to look at it holistically. But it's a huge, it's, a, it's ambitious and it's exciting. Thank you very much. And um, Friedrich, could you explain how your company is responding to this SDG challenge? <coughs> yes, thank you and good morning. Uh, so just before I get to that, I just want to give a short, uh, in this case, a Swedish uh, fashion and interior company. Uh, it's a family-run company that's been around since 1901. Uh, so before getting into what we do in terms of environment and, and water issues, which is big, of course, in the textile industry, uh, we started looking at the social issues like the right payments and security and health and safety at, the, at, at our suppliers because we design in Stockholm and then our suppliers are mainly in India. Uh, so starting working with our suppliers maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, we are, what we do is long-term relationships with our suppliers. So having come a long way in the social um, issues also made it easier for us when we started uh, about 15 years ago looking into especially the, the water. But for us, of course, it's energy and transport and water as well. But when we then started looking at water, um, it was much easier because we have already built up this trust and dialogue with our suppliers, who are mainly also family-run businesses. Uh, so we, what we haven't done so much yet is measure what we do. We have done a lot of things in different areas, but what we see now when the SDGs have come and what probably Mr. Ban Ki-moon would have said, the, the, the companies in the world now have the great responsibility and an opportunity bigger than ever before to actually uh, create change fast. So water is one area, but all the other areas that you mentioned as well, uh, and innovation and climate, um, climate change, of course, but also responsible con production and consumption. We need to set clear targets now, which we have started doing in my company. The last six months now, it's really getting down to putting high targets and also follow up that, of course, all the time. So we have to become better also putting tough targets on ourselves in terms of material, water use, all that. But I will get back to maybe some examples later. Thank you. I mean, just in terms of those targets, you set yourself targets, so that's, that's for your organization. Um, do you set targets for the supply chain? You know, you said you, you were talking with your long-term suppliers and introducing the environmental concerns, but will you be setting targets for the sort of like your, your whole supply chain or just for the part which is your company? No, I mean, when we look at materials, for instance, I mean, we have set targets that we should reduce some of the materials and increase some of the better materials, but uh, it all comes down to the supply chain anyway, because if we go to our main suppliers, that's not where the issue is. It's, it's down the line, so we have to go to the subcontractors of our suppliers as well. So just to give you a short example, um, water in India, for instance, in some parts, uh, not so many years ago, there were, it was a saying that you could see the color of the groundwater, what color of the fashion in, in the West. So, I mean, some of the water from the effluent after dyeing and um, coloring the clothes would just let out to the to the environment, uh, to the ground. But, uh, and of course, our main supplies said that everything is fine. But then when we started going 
steps done, we could actually see this happening ourselves. And from there, so the measurement absolutely goes down to both our suppliers, but even more important down. And do you know how you're going to monitor that? Uh, there are many ways, but uh, of course, we can only, as purchasing team and designers, we can only decide the materials that we have to stop using and the ones that we need to increase using. But um, when it comes to water, um, it's also a lot about uh, collaboration with other companies. Because um, we, as one company, we can do a lot. But when you bring other companies along, you can get the huge impact. So, uh, so do you find that you're building capacity amongst your suppliers in developing countries? Is that something that you're actively pursuing? Yeah. I mean, the way we did it was because we, we said, okay, we're a textile company. We, we pollute water a lot, as everyone knows. So we need to take action on this. Uh, uh, how, how can we do it better? So we actually first started talking to our colleagues in the industry. We said, hey, we're not experts on water, but what can we do together uh, as other textile companies? So the first, the, so the other companies were a little bit um, hesitant. But then now, three years later, it's 30 of the, our big, biggest competitors are part of this network where we, I mean, we came up with mutual guidelines that we take down to, to our suppliers. Um, and the impact, of course, is much big, bigger. And then I also, because I, I want to get down to the measurability, then uh, having the guidelines, we also, of course, need to get them in practice. So we started working with some of our suppliers, um, uh, more like an educational program, all the workers there, and how you can actually be more and more water efficient. And uh, because I'm taking so much time, I just want to wrap up. I mean, two, after two years, this educational program has meant for the 64 suppliers involved, has meant that it saved more than a thousand tons of chemicals. Uh, it saved 370 millions of liters. And the energy, of course, is also good. But in the end, also, the best part is that it's, for those that took part in this program, is 450% ROI. So, I mean, it all comes down to business. As sustainable business is profitable, if you... Yeah. Can I say something? Sure, yeah. go ahead. I'm just wondering, you're talking three years, as Johan mentioned, I came from Greenpeace before I worked at the International yeah. Water Association, and Greenpeace had a big water campaign to detox the fashion industry. So did you need to push from the outside, or did you as a company decide yourself to move ahead? Because I think that's, in, that's the relevant topic for this uh, forum, yeah. is that do we need the SDGs and do we need the targets, or is it actually something that we decide ourselves? Companies, when you think about responsible business, it's something that you know is the right thing to do, so you don't need the push from the outside. I mean, for us, it's both. I mean, as I said, we started already in the 50s working with both environmental and social issues, and we used to call it common sense before, <laughs> before we talked about CSR and all that. But, um, so, of course, NGOs and, uh, and our customers, we want, we want their demand as well, but we as an industry need to, to be ahead, of course. Yeah. But I think you helped as well <laughs> to push it forward, of course. Mr. Pranoma, you, you, you have a, quite a large supply chain as well, so how, how do you find um, working with the supply chain and do you feel you can take you know, sort of responsibility for improving the environmental performance down the supply chain as well? What experience have you had? Uh, yeah, before coming to that, uh, we also uh, got prompted by the NGOs and so uh, thank you for that. Uh, the Supply chains, we, we have uh, to talk in two parts. One is what we call as upstream supply chain, where we buy fruit bunches. Uh, because we have our own plantations, our mills, crude palm oil mills, are actually uh, using 93% of input from our own plantations. But we still buy 7% to 8% in average in a year from uh, smallholders in the area that is not part of our scheme. Relatively, working with those smallholders uh, who are within 50 kilometers of our mills is not difficult because we have daily interactions. We help them in, in all kinds of good agricultural practices that is possible. So that's relatively okay. 
But on the downstream side, where we, our refineries, bought about half of it, of its input from uh, the trading oil in, in the country from other mills, then the challenge is to identify the sources that those mills are uh, processing. We have a plan to have 100% traceability from mills by December this year. So every mills will have coordinates and because of that we know more or less the trees that they are getting, the fruit bunches. As a, as a simple rule on palm oil, we normally take fruit bunches within 50 kilometers of our mills. So if we know where the mills we are buying from, then we know more or less the plantation. That's where the problem began. Because some of the mills are certified and run by good companies, but they also have expansion activities in other islands. They are uh, cutting forests in Papua or converting peatland. And when we engage them, discuss with them, please stop doing that. Some of them are uh, quickly responding in a positive way. Some are delaying and keep on doing. So we, we have to stop buying from them. And that's, of course, our friends from the NGOs are happy. But our governments are not happy. Because then those small and medium companies ask the government support. Uh, from this type of pressure to become better, pressures to become sustainable from the big companies. And that's where we are seeing we need to move into a different mode. Uh, it is not possible to create change based on targeting big companies because at the end of the day, the, the level of influence, the level of, of yeah, influence, you can say that, uh, of those big companies are limited. In palm oil sector, more than half are smallholders, and that involves millions of farmers. Uh, so we, we need to deal with the crux of the issue with the small farmers, where poverty is uh, a big challenge. So, so if we look at some of the SDGs on land and the targets, they're pretty ambitious. So uh, by 2020, we will ensure sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, in particular forests, and by 2020, promote the implementation of sustainable management of all types of forest, halt deforestation and restore degraded forest, and also halt biodiversity loss by 2020 and prevent and uh, protect and prevent extinction of threatened species. Now, that, that's five years' time, most of those targets. Um, so you're saying here that, um, and, and some of the questions from the audience are, are, are also wondering about your influence as part of all the stakeholders who would need to work together to achieve those SDGs. Now, you know, you're saying that your, your influence is limited, um, but somehow the government, the large companies, and the smallholders need to sort of start pointing in the same direction if we're going to achieve those SDGs. So how do you feel that can work? I mean, how is, how is it, what, what's the way forward if, you know, you're saying that your individual company influence is limited, but what you're implying, I suppose, is that you need to be pointing the same direction as the government and somehow bring the small holes along with you. How is that going to work? It can work if uh, the part is not only within Indonesia, but also internationally works together. Because the big structural issue is uh, involving poverty, and poverty elevation is a big agenda that needs to be solved. Employment at the very remote areas are a challenge that can be solved by other industries. You cannot rely everything on agriculture uh, because at the end of the day, land is limited. Other types of employment need to be generated. The easiest to move the next step is by bringing the buyers on board because it's very easy for the buyers to put conditions. We're not going to buy if you are not following one, two, three, four, five banks. That's also what the NGOs have been asking. But what if it's uh, coming to the smallholders? What to those who don't have that flexibility to comply? So then there has to be some more closer relationship from those who demanded sustainable products to also help solving the problem of those million smallholders. Uh, we will take our part, 
and and that has been already ongoing. But the bigger populations of those who de depend their life on agriculture will need supports from the government, from the big buyers, and from normal consumers. Don't pass the responsibility to them. It's not mm -hmm. fair to them. And so, I mean, it's an interesting one. You, you bring up the buyers. I mean, that's where you're particularly, you're, you're a representative of a buyer here. Um, the buyers do have some power over the supply chain. Um, do you think that, that we can improve or increase that influence? I mean, I'm not quite sure how the buyers are going to, or do you have an idea how the buyers could influence? The simple way things? is to come up with premium price. Dedicated premium price for smallholder, for example or having a, an area that you will work beyond gen, than buying sustainable products, but also do some poverty elevation projects. Mm. Is, does this ring a bell with you from your experience? Yeah, for us it's been, I mean, a lot of the, some of the supplies that we worked with many years ago, and some still, I mean, we, we still have a long way to go in some parts, but uh, we have always been, saying that if, if there is a will to change, uh, we have a few like lists, like you say, things that we want to see improved, uh, and we agree up on certain things that we need to change. Uh, if there is a will to change, we stay, uh, and 99% of the suppliers have been willing to improve, and then we work together and get things done. And uh, for those who haven't done that, they're probably not in business today, so constantly improving also as a supplier and yeah. doing it together. That also means new business because we are only one of the buyers at our supplier. So improving things in terms of social issues or uh, getting your water treatment plant in, in place that also gives you new business. And so if you're not, if you haven't reached that level today, uh, so I think we as a buyer, of course, can play, play a big role. But also our buyers, our customers also play a huge role. So I come from, the technology sector before, uh, and there, um, I mean, I was working for Canon, so they do big business-to-business -business products, and the demand from our customers there were huge, and the demand from our customers today, buying fashion, for instance, is increasing, but we would still like to see more, like... In terms of more demand for sustainable products. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I was wondering, so, so you know, let, let, let's assume that the private sector can do their bit in terms of improving their performance and so forth. But in the end, it's the water quality, the air quality, the total amount of CO2 which matters. And um, when companies are, are in developing countries where the governments don't have the resources, for example, to monitor water quality, what responsibility do you think the private sector might have in those situations? I think companies know that what the right thing is to do. And I think the fashion industry has been a very good example where big Western companies did the right thing back home and decided that where they thought they couldn't be uh, exposed, they did the thing that was not right, whether it was pollution or um, uh, the women's rights, if we've, like we've seen in Bangladesh. So I think today's, the fortunate thing is that the world is connected and consumers are connected. So we stand up and, and through social media, the pressure is there. So I think more and more companies are not going to be able to get away with it anymore. And so why would you do the right thing where you're based and where you're maybe on the stock exchange and not do the right thing where maybe mm. local circumstance and local governance is not the right thing? And as an association, what we're trying to do is create uh, the tools that bring the different stakeholders together. So um, from a water-specific perspective, if you think about the regulation, if you think about the utilities, if you think about the companies, bring them all together and make sure that what is happening in certain countries where the governance is right, where regulations is in place, learn from that and apply it in another country and don't hide behind the fact that either the government hasn't put it in place or there's no regulation. Um, because you can actually do it. I mean, it's challenging. It's not easy. Right. Um, but I think companies do know what the right thing is to do. And transparency is key. I, I agree. And I think since we have uh, established methodology to measure the carbon footprints, the water footprints, so actually companies can be asked to report back on their carbon footprint and water footprints. The question is then, 
what would be the incentive for the companies to do that? Because if it's the extra cost, extra investments, then it's taken for granted. Then there will not be a lot of uh, buys in from the sector. One of the questions from the audience, and I'd like to, I don't know if there are some microphones in the audience, but I'd like to open this to, to the audience in a bit. But there's one question here is that, um, uh, you know, for your business, for example, um, at Golden Agri, do you set quantitative targets um, for different parts of your operation in relation to the environment? Oh, we already said that. We have a, a no deforestation pledge. We have no peatland development pledge. We have no burning pledge. And we, we can be held accountable for that. So uh, that's already been said. You know, we, we are developing uh, the data, the, the complexity data, to come up with a target on water, which is a bit difficult because we are talking about plantation. Yeah. We, we need to account for the rainwaters and whatnot, so we're still learning about how to to come up with acceptable measurements. Because the SDGs imply, you know, a lot of targets being set by companies if we're going to be able to add it up and work out whether we're going to sort of save the planet or not. So if we don't measure it, then we won't know if we're progressing in the right direction or not. So do you think that you will be doing more of this? In, in On the carbon will the SDGs yes. make a difference to you? Uh, well, the, the problem is I don't know what is the SDG target on carbon. Uh, and, and I think that had been negotiated by the governments. Right? Yeah. So our contribution is as much as our operation. Mm. But you could set, set your targets to reduce your yes, carbon intensity. Yes, we do. And, and fortunately, in, in a few of our buyers, they have a clear targets also. Okay. So if we can come up with a product of less than 500 tons of CO2 per tons of products, then we could get some premium price. Unfortunately, that is also a small buyer. The, the, the big ones are not there yet. But on that front, again, I think there are examples of carbon neutral approaches with regards to companies. And there's a, a fantastic story of um, uh, Western Australia, a utility in Australia, led by a CEO called uh, Sue Murphy. She won the Woman in Water Award. And it's totally with regards to uh, new energy, carbon neutrality, uh, community management. So I think there are best practices uh, around the world. This is a water-specific one. I'm sure there is elsewhere. I think companies can learn from one another and making sure that you, know, you can get to the carbon and energy neutral uh, business. Very good. I'd really like to open this to the audience now. I see um, there's a hand over there and a hand over there. So we start there, so please, could you ask your question? Sure, thank you. I'm Vivian Liu from Philanthropy Works and also one of the young global leaders of the World Economic Forum uh, that is helping to bring about a more sustainable world via the SDGs. Uh, question for Agus. Um, we note your you know, no-burning policy. Are you able to substantiate that? How do you know amongst you know, um, all the hectares that you've got, how do you know that there was no burning. Are you able to prove or substantiate your comments? Can I answer that? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> yes, you, actually, if it's burning, you can verify it through satellites. That's very easy. And we have reports, we have police reports. We can substantiate that. Of our 500,000 hectares of plantation, the one that is burned is less than 0.5%. Do you, do you take responsibility for some of the natural forest in your landscapes where you have the plantations? Uh, some of the area within our plantations, yes. And if they got burned, we put it off. If it's forest, we rehabilitate. Okay. There's a question over there. Yeah, I just, uh, <clears throat> my name is Thomas Wu. I'm CEO of Glex AG and from Switzerland. And I mentioned this yesterday in my panel uh, we are, I think companies have to look sometimes outside the box in, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, building up awareness for water sensitiv uh, sensitivity. Um, we are sponsoring actually with uh, your competitor from Spain uh, a major education program in China for water awareness. So we trained uh, over the last three years uh, over 5 million Chinese students 
on uh, sustainable water management and how to uh, uh, get this uh, awareness into their respective communities. We formed about 120 water clubs at Chinese universities and colleges, and uh, the website had over 60 million hits in the last 12 months. You know, so I think we are building up a huge awareness within, let's say, the next generation in China, and we do it sometimes with very little measures. For instance, we. Uh, so, so, do you have a question? Yeah, Sorry. And I think. Uh, uh, beyond you know, going uh, into your own operation, do you go beyond in your companies in terms of building up this water awareness? Who'd like to take that one? Well, for, for us, it's, uh, I would say yes, because we're, we're 700 uh, employees in my company. We're not super big, we're not IKEA or H&M, but we're 100 stores, uh, and all the employees in our stores they also get educated as well as our uh, suppliers. We try to educate as many as possible and also put targets on how many we want educated every year in, in sustainable water management. But we also, of course, need everyone in the company involved from the design team to the purchasers to also have this mindset when it comes to both water and all the other like materials that you Im improve, um, increase or some materials that you shouldn't use because of the water use, for instance. Uh, but I think also, when in terms of innovation, it's uh, for us as a company, it's also about being passionate about all the things that have got to do with the environment and also be passionate about communicating. That's my other role, so I'm the communications manager. You also need to communicate it to, to our customers and get them on board with both telling them how it is, both good things and the bad things, and also making maybe some more easier to understand yeah. projects, like plastic, for instance. We don't need more plastic in the sea, so we were one, one of the first companies, or the first companies, to start charging for our plastic bags. Um, it's just a small step, and the money goes to the National Environment uh, Agency in Sweden, so it's just getting the consumers on board uh, uh, and telling the story all the time. So, um, Agus, there's a question here that, in a similar vein. So, saying that, should you try and influence smallholders, work with the smallholders, educate them to stop, stop these, some of these destructive practices? Is that, you, do you feel that's your role as a large company? Uh, yes, especially if they are having business with us. That's much easier. If, if it's far from our location, then it's a bit strange. Uh, they, probably not going to welcome us going there. But we are also going to do learning from one of uh, the other company uh, to work with the villages surrounding our plantations. Uh, there is an, an idea that we will start immediately as early as next year, early next year, to work five kilometers area within our boundaries uh, with the villagers to uh, come up with solutions that they can continue uh, doing that agriculture without using fire. Mm. But again, that is only five kilometers surrounding our plantations, which is not much in the scheme of things. Our plantation is only uh, less than 5% of total palm oil plantations in Indonesia. Mm. It's clearly a complex problem. C could I just, before we um, wrap up, so I understand we've got about another five minutes, is that right? Yeah. She would like to have a follow-up. There's some other questions here. Um, okay, let's take that question first. And I've got at the back, just behind you, the mic. Hello, uh, Coralie from WWF. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of payment for ecosystem services, which usually come from the public sector to encourage small farmers to adopt sustainable practices, for example. So do you think it's something that the private sector could use as a financial reward for approach to water or commodity production to encourage smallholders to adopt sustainable practices by paying a premium on sustainable palm oil, for example. For you, I guess, first. The payment of ecosystem practices have been tried and easily done when you're talking about one uh, river system the industry on the downstream pay compensations to community on the upstream, it has been tried. 
But for palm oil, small and big, I think you need to come up with the business logic of it to make it workable. If they are not part of the production chains, then it will be difficult to do so. But if there are relationships of sharing of resources, of, of rivers, of whatnot, then yes, we, we could develop that. It will be very situational and will be very different from one location to another. Do, do you work with the other large palm oil producers in a combined way to try and address yes, these problems? Yes, we do. In, in fact, September last year, we have the Indonesian Palm Oil Pledge, where four companies at that time, and then joined the fifth company earlier this year. So five of us have shared the same commitment of no deforestation, no peatland conversion, and no burning, and others. So I'd just like to ask one, one question um, before we sum up, and, and that's when we've got all of this sustainability reporting, so we've talked about it a bit, you know, sort of you're, you're developing new targets and new reporting systems, and it seems a lot of industries are doing that. The SDGs put further demands on that. Um, and there are, there are thousands of metrics which are used to, to, to report supply chain sustainability. Do you feel that there should be some sort of harmonization? Um, and you know, would you say, would you prefer a mandatory versus a voluntary approach? You know, so that you have to report on certain criteria, which can be agreed between companies, and then you've got a chance of adding up the total impact. So, perhaps all three of you, maybe start at this end. What do you think? How are we going to how are we going to measure progress towards these SDGs? I think it's very important. It's, it's good that we have the target. It's good that we measure. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all because uh, the, the problems are so challenging that you can't go for an easy fix and an easier way of monitoring. Um, and I think we can't hide behind the monitoring either. I think we need to move forward. And I think, as the discussion has shown, multi-stakeholder approach is an important one. It's not just sitting down, it's actually working through the challenges together. I think as both of my fellow panelists have indicated, I think then we know what the right thing is to do. I think future generations are not going to thank us for being so co uh, competitive still, but I think it's about competition. Where can you indeed work together? Because we just have this one world. Um, so yeah, let's measure where we can, but let's not hide behind the measurement in order to create the right kind of progress. Thirdly. Yeah, I agree, and I just I just came to think that I, that I think that there is a saying that if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go exactly. together with others, and we need to do them both, of course. But in terms of, in Sweden, you have to report starting from 2017, so for us it's not voluntary. Even if voluntary would be maybe, I, I, in an ideal world, that would be the best, but uh, um, probably mandatory in some parts is needed, uh, I think. Um, but also as the, um, the SDG Compass by UN Global Compact says, it's, I mean, you as an organization have to look what impacts you, where you can do the most improvements um, and focus on those areas and implement them in your organization and set targets. And of course, you have to, uh, in some way, report the progress. Picking up from the previous uh, opinion, I've, we can go either way mandatory or voluntary. Uh, in fact, if mandatory, it's easier. Voluntary, it takes a little bit more effort, but mandatory, yes. And I agree that we need to travel together to achieve a sectoral, the whole industry uh, change. But that's also where the problem is. When you travel together, the speed of the convoy is determined by the slowest. Uh, we can continue to be moving ahead but we cannot leave the big chunk of it behind. So I think we have to wrap up now. So um, it would seem to me that the SDGs are producing a, a useful framing for further, further work, putting also further pressure on private sector and governments. Um, but we need to understand how, you know, we, we talked about we've got to sort of work together. How is that going to happen? How is it going to pan out? How will the responsibilities of the private sector versus government versus smallholders, how is all that going to work? Um, there's a bit of further work, but just some, in, in 30 seconds each, just sum up what your feelings are about the most important bits of progress or 
what, what things do you think are important in the, ne in the next few years in terms of moving towards the SDGs? If Take you want. a holistic approach. Yeah, I see all of them as uh, inspiration. I mean, is there, there are 17 goals and there could be new business opportunities looking at them, of course. And doing it together with others as goal 17 is partnerships. I think that's, uh, that's one way. And yesterday I also heard a lot of, uh, so there are many business leaders here. I was thinking about that because, I mean, everyone is a business leader. If you're not taking sustainability into your uh, operations fully, then, then you're not a business leader. So. Everyone here, I think, is pretty involved, but, yeah. Final word, I My guess. Uh, I think uh, the approach that we have witnessed in the past is to boycott bad industries, and that is a good wake-up call. But you cannot con transform the whole sector only through boycotting. There are solutions, creative solutions, collaborations, the painful, long way of doing, bringing everybody on board that will transform the industry toward sustainable industry. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for your inputs, and uh, we'll finish there.